good time, Delilah. See you later, Jack. Extra hour of sleep. How do you feel this morning? You okay? <clears throat> I feel good. I feel good. I'm ready to go this morning. And uh, let me just say to you, before we begin our time together of continued study inside of God's Word, if you have somehow gotten through the doors and into the auditorium without picking up one of these self-contained communion cups, I want to just remind you in just a few moments, we're going to share together uh, in the elements of communion, uh, now would be the time. Uh, to run back there to the, uh, the doors, grab that if you will, so you can participate a bit later. If you're online with us this morning, uh, want to go ahead and, and maybe have the opportunity to go ahead and, and set aside uh, some juice, some bread, as we share that time together and commune together, uh, all together, albeit in sometimes very different places this morning. And so uh, we'll be sharing that time in just a few moments. <clears throat> Before we have the opportunity to, uh, to open God's Word, before we have a chance to go ahead and read a very specific text this morning, I would like to invite you, if you would, to walk back with me, to come back with me to the days of Jesus and uh, inside of His culture, the very common word for greeting one another, for saying hello to one another, for saying goodbye to one another, was this Hebrew word. It's familiar. It's the word shalom. Uh, let me go ahead, invite you if you would, say this word with me. One more time. Now I'd like for you to go ahead and, and just like it was greeting time, stand up with me and say hello to the people around you using that word. Okay, use that word. Just all around you. Let me hear you nice and loud. All kind of confusion. Noah, shalom, Noah. Shalom. Shalom. How are you doing, Levi? That's good. Thank you. You can uh, have a seat. <clears throat> now, an interesting thing about that word. Uh, it is uh, normally, you know, we, we take a look at some of these Greek words, right, from the New Testament. This is from the Old Testament. It's the word shalom. And this word has a variety of meanings. What's really, really hard sometimes is when you're trying to go ahead and to translate a word from a different language into English. Oftentimes, these words don't have a one-word equivalent. They mean something much broader, something much bigger than just one word. So uh, let's go to the next slide. Here is what this means. And so uh, a little bit of liberty taken maybe with this word uh, means hello. So if you were to see somebody in the marketplace, you would say, Shalom. If you were getting ready to leave the conversation, you'd say the exact same word, Shalom. Uh, if you were saying, I don't know, howdy, that's a little bit of a stretch maybe. Uh, if you're going to see you later is Shalom. If you haven't seen them in a while, you're going to wrap your arms around and say, Shalom. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. This word means all of these words and all of this sentiment inside of the Old Testament. And by the time of Jesus' day, because he is Hebrew, he is Jewish, uh, because the community that he was in uh, used Aramaic or Jewish to communicate, this still was the greeting. Shalom. Shalom. And you didn't have to think up several words, uh, one word covered all of that. The interesting thing then is over the years we've tried to go ahead and add some definition to this word and the hard thing is that we've tried then to reduce this to a one word equivalent that just doesn't work. Many of you then would probably say, yeah I know what that word shalom means in Hebrew and for many of us, we want to go ahead and think that the definition for this word is just a singular word. And I want to say to you today, it is much, much broader than that. Let's go to the next slide if we could. Some of us would go ahead and think that, yes, shalom means peace. It means peace. And I think probably at first glance, that is exactly right. If you were to just use a one word equivalent, Shalom does in fact mean peace. But I just want to say to you, it is much bigger than that. It is much broader than that. It is 
uh, a narrow understanding to just think it is peace, but the implication is so much bigger. I want to think with you then, before we have a chance to uh, come back to the Beatitudes, to kind of do just a little bit of a word study, if you will, about this word shalom. Because without it, we really can't understand exactly what Jesus wants us to know when we get to the New Testament. And so, uh, let's go to the next slide and recognize that oftentimes uh, we have a tendency, since we want to go ahead and believe that shalom means peace, uh, we think that it's the absence of war, or the absence of strife, or the absence of conflict. And we try to define the word peace by saying what it is not. And so we want to try to emphasize the negative. But the Bible does not do that with the word shalom. The Bible does not do that with the word shalom. Shalom is not a negative situation, that it's the absence of conflict, or it's the absence of war, or it's the absence of strife. That is not what shalom is. It is not uh, where something is missing. You don't define shalom by the negative. In fact, it's a very positive word. It's a positive word that implies something much larger, much grander, much bigger. One author says that shalom is everything which makes for a person's highest good. Everything which makes for a person's highest good. And so when I say, you know, Noah, shalom, what I'm saying to you, look, Noah, all good things should be coming in your direction. All great things should come in your direction. Everything that would make you full, everything that would make you complete, Everything that would make you the fullest, the largest, the grandest person that God has intended you to be. Shalom. And that's a whole lot different than just peace be with you. It means all of God's blessing. All of your well-being. Fulfilled. Almost too, there's a flavor of the idea that there's a peacefulness, a serenity that comes with this. Not peace of mind necessarily, as much as it's all peace that I'm blessing you with. Shalom. Now the best, the very best illustration of this that we see anywhere inside of Scripture described is found in God's full intention when He creates humanity. Inside of the garden... Everything is shalom. Inside of God's creation, everything is shalom. It is inside of God's initial creation that we recognize that it was intended that the lion lay down with the lamb. Shalom. It is full on well being, full on peace, full on serenity. Everything as intended. As a matter of fact, if you spend a great deal of time in the area of, of Old Testament studies or Hebrew reading, it is the garden that is the quintessential definition for shalom. That's where God had intended everything to be harmonized. And that is a terrific word to describe shalom. All pieces all elements working in harmony together. Shalom. And so when you greet someone, when you have the opportunity to speak to them, that is the intention. Shalom. That your life, all aspects of your life, all moving pieces would be moving in harmony and you're thinking, yes, sign me up for that. Sign me up for that. I wish that that were so inside of my life. Now what's fascinating then, and you know this fully well, that when individuals inside the garden, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, shalom exploded. Shalom exploded. It was shipwrecked when the decision was made to elevate their decision over God's direction. 
and it came crumbling down. And it came crumbling down so quickly that not only was there conflict amongst Adam and Eve themselves, but there was conflict as well, where once there was shalom with God, now that was broken. And so you only have to get one more page over in Scripture until the sons of Adam and Eve, now shalom is catastrophically broken and murder takes place inside of our world. God had intended shalom, but humanity had a different decision and the outcome we have been living with ever since. You may be interested to know, though, that one of the characterizations or one of the ways in which the Bible wants us to understand who God is, is around this term, shalom. Let's go to the next slide if we could. And so inside of the Old Testament, this is one of the descriptive phrases. This is one of the names, if you will, for God that is given. God by his very attribute, by his very nature, by his very character, is a God who is a God of peace. He's a God of peace. He's complete. He's fulfilled in himself. He's self-contained, needs no other. He is a God of peace. And so as a result of that, inside of the Old Testament, as the descriptions and the understanding of who God is kind of ripples out through the garden and on into the first family and on into the, the first group of individuals that God calls, the understanding is that God is a God of peace. And so Jehovah Shalom becomes something that all folks are introduced to as they follow this God. Let's go to the next slide and be reminded that everything for a person's highest good then can be found in a relationship with Jehovah Shalom. Everything that is necessary that we would be fulfilled can be found in a relationship with Jehovah Shalom. Everything that is necessary for our existence, says the Old Testament, can be found inside of a relationship with Jehovah Shalom. We can be whole, we can be complete, we can be as God had intended us, fully, completely, fully human, when we know Jehovah Shalom. So much so that Isaiah writes these words, God will keep in perfect peace this is an amazing statement. God will keep in shalom the person whose mind is steadfast. Or another translation says this, whose mind is fixed on him. Now, don't miss what happens here. The implication inside of the Bible is this, that by faith, the God who is shalom in his very character and nature, that when we place our confidence and trust in him, we too, our nature, our character, can be shared from him. That any peace that we would experience, any fulfillment, any completeness, is not something we know in and of ourselves, but comes from beyond who we are. That's why it's such a magnificent story to tell as we understand Jehovah Shalom, that God wants to do a work inside of people's lives so that they might find fullness, completeness, peace. That was what was so fascinating around the language inside the Old Testament when they begin to look for the arrival of Jesus onto the page of history. We'll read this next verse several times as we make our way towards Christmas. Let's go to the next slide. It's maybe the most familiar of all prophetic statements about the birth of Jesus. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, 
mighty God, everlasting Father. Read it with me. He's called the what? One more time, called what? The Prince of Peace. Here's the fascinating statement that Jehovah Shalom, His Son, is the embodiment, is the personification, is the incarnation of God. He's the Prince of Peace. The increase of His government, there will be in peace, there will be no end, and He will reign over His kingdom. And so the understanding is that when the Messiah comes, when Jesus is born, He is the Prince of Peace, and He is going to bring peace. And that is what the book of Matthew introduces us to. That is what the Beatitudes introduce us to. The one who has come, His rightful kingdom, the one who's the King of Kings, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace, talking to us about what his kingdom will look like. Now, by the time you get to the New Testament, this idea about God, who is Jehovah Shalom, is not lost on the New Testament writers. As a matter of fact, this actually helps us build a bridge because we are talking not about a different God. We're talking about the exact same God. And so the New Testament says it this way. In Ephesians... He is our peace. He's our peace. So much so that the New Testament would boldly and without any reservation make this claim. That if you want to know what it means to be complete, if you want to know what it means to be fulfilled, if you want to need what it means to be uh, at peace, and we oftentimes even use uh, that aspect of a serenity prayer, if you want to know what that is like, you can't know that without knowing who Jesus Christ is, says the New Testament writers. He's our peace. And so Paul, then in the book of Romans, notice if you will, he uses this language. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, since we've crossed the line and have believed him, we've trusted in him, We've asked him to come and live inside of our life. We've asked the one who is Jehovah Shalom to come dwell inside of our hearts. He is our peace. We have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Peace with God. All of that serves really as a backdrop to our understanding of our statement today that comes from the Beatitudes. There in Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 5, Jesus, after he is describing some other internal aspects, he wants to talk to us about then what it looks like to live in his kingdom and how if we are people who would proclaim that we know the Prince of Peace, how we should then act to the people who are around us. If the nature of God, who is Jehovah Shalom, comes to dwell inside of our hearts, then how should we then respond to the people around us? Now, let me just say to you this morning that... Let me take a quick detour, if I could, and recognize and at least mention out loud that there are some really confusing sections inside of the Bible. If God is Jehovah Shalom, why are there so many areas of conflict? And why does the Old Testament look like the Old Testament of battle, while the New Testament looks like the gospel of peace? Also, you have to really struggle then with a statement that Jesus makes himself. He is the one who's the prince of peace. And he stands on the page of history and says, blessed are the peacemakers. But if you take your Bible and you flip it over, I think it's in Matthew chapter 10. Jesus himself makes this statement. I did not come to bring peace. And you're thinking, hold on a second. You're the prince of peace. And so you have some of these things that really demand and really They need careful thinking inside of our culture. 
And I've met several people who've made the statement that because this is the characteristic of God in the Old Testament, and yet there's so much conflict there, how in the world can I trust in a God like that? And we live in a a world that really wrestles with that tension. And I want to say to you, that is a, a little bit, that takes a message all to itself. But if God is the same yesterday, Jehovah Shalom. He is the same God today, the Prince of Peace. He will be the same God tomorrow. Then we can trust His Word today. And we can trust even some of the things that make us scratch our head and go, hmm, I'm not quite sure I understand how that gets put together. I want to say to you, we do know this. Jesus invites us to consider the fact that if he's the one who can come and dwell in our hearts by faith and we can share his nature, he says this, blessed are the peacemakers. Now I want to talk with you for just a couple of moments about that phrase. Let me remind you that the Beatitudes, look over here with me on on the wall, that the Beatitudes are structured a lot like the cross. That there is a vertical dynamic where God does something inside of our lives and that there is a horizontal dynamic that we then live that out to the people that are around us. Jesus wants us to know that even before we can be people who are peacemakers, we are invited to go ahead and have a relationship with him, the Jehovah Shalom, because he can do something inside of our heart so that we can have peace with God. Peace with God. And when we receive the peace of God, then we can have the peace of God and live that out in front of other people. When we receive peace with God, we can live out the peace of God with other people. Let's look closely at just a couple of quick verses, if we could, out of the Gospel of John. Let's go to the next slide, if we could. Jesus' words. Shalom, I leave with you. Complete, fulfilled. Shalom, I leave with you. My shalom I give to you. I am Jehovah Shalom. I do not give you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And then this verse, one more. I have told you these things, said Jesus, so that in, hold on a second, me, I got to fix my own slides, in me, you may have peace. Because there's nowhere else you're going to find that, said Jesus. In this world you're going to have trouble, take heart, I have overcome the world. And so as a result of that, in Graham's book, where he makes the statement about, if we know these beatitudes, this is God's intention for our happiness. He said that there are, is ways, there is a way for us to go ahead and find peace with God. And that starts by stop fighting him. Stop fighting him. That also includes an aspect of surrender. If he is the one who is our peace, who can bring completeness and fulfillment, then lay down your arms and raise up your hands and say, Lord, I surrender to what you want to do inside of my life. At this point, he says this. Hurt people hurt people. And it's fascinating that sometimes people who struggle internally inside of their lives and they're conflicted inside of their lives and have lived conflicted lives. He said, it's a funny thing how it is that people, we're invited to be people who are peacemakers and instead we are people who are peace takers in our relationship with him and with others. He said, you know, that can be fixed if we surrender. He can be, a, do a work inside of our heart where we are peacetakers in all the relationships around us and help us be peacemakers. And that happens by serving. 
That's the outworking. It's a vertical relationship, and then it's a horizontal relationship. We become peacemakers when we take the initiative frequently inside of people's life. That is not a passive word, but it is an active word. And so William Barclay says this, that people who are peacemakers are those who pursue right relationships in every sphere of life. And listen, it's only God that can do that inside of a person's life. It's only God that can do that in our lives. Shalom. Shalom. Now our time's running on us this morning. And so let me just close real quickly if I could and uh, share with you uh, this prayer that's been passed down about what this looks like to live in shalom with one another. It is, is attributed to Francis of Assisi. However, uh, more recently, I think that scholars have said that it probably isn't Francis of Assisi, but uh, they're not quite sure who wrote this. <clears throat> I'd like for you to go ahead and read with me, if you will, because here's the thing. Notice, if you will, the idea of peace with God, that he could do something inside of our hearts and our lives when we surrender to him. Then our lives, we receive the peace of God so that we could share that with the people who are around us. I'm going to ask the music team if they'll make their way back to the platform. But as they're coming this direction, I would like for you to read with me this really very famous prayer. And perhaps even we could make this our prayer of preparation as we get ready to share together the elements of communion. Let's read together. Lord, make me an instrument of your shalom. Of your shalom. Lord, do something in me that I can go ahead and be a peacemaker to other people. Do something first in me because I can't give away what I don't have. Do something in me. Sorry, I interrupted you. Let's go back. <laughs> Lord, make me an instrument of your peace where there is hatred. Let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Let's go back to the one slide before if we could. Good. I'd like for you to kind of look at that if you will. Let's keep that in front of us. I think that these actions are really kind of provide a summary of what Jesus might be saying to you and to me. Peacemakers. I'd like to invite you to grab your communion elements. <clears throat> the one who's the Prince of Peace gathered his disciples together in a rather conflicted moment. He knew he was headed to the cross and they were going to take his life. He gathered them together around the, the table in the upper room and they took some very familiar elements, bread and wine, and Jesus gave these very ordinary elements, extraordinary meaning. I think this morning that by inviting them to ingest that he is inviting them to be reminded that he wants to be part of their lives and I want to say to you this morning the same way he wants you to be a person who takes his peace to the world to be peacemakers so that Jehovah Shalom can move inside of your heart the Prince of Peace can do something in your life and he has the capacity for you to give that 
away. Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this bread is my body, broken for you, take and eat it. In the midst of understanding, not only the love of God, but the peace that surpasses all understanding, it happens through one of the most conflicted moments and unfair moments in all of human history, where the one who was sinless was pinned to a tree, his hands and his feet. I have the ability to go ahead and give you peace. I have the ability to do something in your heart, and I can give you my nature and my character so that you can be a person where there is hatred, you can sow love. Where there is injury, you can sow pardon. Where there is doubt, you can aggressively pursue and invite people to share faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, you can be the light. Where there is sadness, you can be joy. Because I have called you, Sharp Town, to be peacemakers in a conflicted world. This is my blood shed for you. Take and drink it.